Hi, and welcome to Chef's Review, a program where we discuss current problems of modern hospitality. My name is Michal Rwowski. Let's have a look. All right, first let me remind you this program is being streamed live, so the more questions you ask on our live chat, the better we will cover the subject. And today's subject is making the menu. It's a hard process, it's a tough nut to crack, so let's get on it. So first of all, uh, let, me, let me just get started with the whole process of creating a menu. It's a very complicated one. It takes a lot of time and effort and it takes a lot and a lot of, lot of uh, research to do. Um, I'm quite surprised that very often uh, people think that making a menu is just in inventing dishes and putting it on the menu and inventing prizes just to go along with it. Um, not many people realize how risky that is and how many losses that this can cause. Um, first of all, a wrongly created menu can be a disaster. It can exceed your uh, capacity, your capability of doing it uh, and generally dis uh, dissatisfied guests. So, how to go about it? How to create a menu? First of all, uh, what you have to do uh, if you are creating a menu for a new place or if it's a, well, well, a very well-known place that you already work with, uh, in and with, um, you have to do some market research. Uh, it sounds very businessy, but it's a very good thing to do and it's not reserved just for corporations, it's also for small businesses. What you have to do is, you know, just figure out the thing that you're comfortable with, um, something you like doing, you know how to do it, and just go around and ask and, you know, just research your location. Um, once you've picked it, of course. So basically, what, what needs to be done, um, I like a lot the American model, if you've seen American cooking shows or culinary shows, um, what they do is they always prepare samples and treats to um, go around with them and, you know, just give people a bit of, you know, something to eat, to have, to uh, judge on and to get some feedback. What they're actually doing, they're gathering a lot, a lot of data on their customers. So that's what you need to do. You have to figure out what your customers want, what your uh, customer, customers feel comfortable with. You need to know uh, what your potential customers are. You have to focus your target group in order to target you know, specific, uh, specific groups uh, in order to get customers. Afterwards, you can change it, of course. You can change the menu, adjust it, and spread uh, sort of the target group a little bit. Uh, not many people know, um, you can make everyone happy. So the more you specify your group, the better. As I said, you can always change it afterwards. But get the data, uh, find out whether there's a company, large company, maybe a factory uh, up close, uh, maybe there's a church, uh, that's also important, maybe a school, because that determines your target group and it determines what the customers, your guests want. So once you've established that, you can proceed to a second step, which is uh, you have to evaluate your location uh, under two aspects. First of all, you have to figure out um, your logistic chain. So what time you can order uh, your uh, where in, uh, what time the, uh, it is going to be delivered, whether you can make a second run, so uh, in case you forgot something, uh, you just need to uh, restock it during service or something like that, whether they're going to come to you, um, and that's all affecting your menu. Uh, let's play with an example. So let's say you have a uh, place in the woods or in, in the city. Uh, if you don't take this into account, um, and you cannot keep up with the traffic or uh, it's not going to be delivered. It's just simply not the right menu for that particular place. So uh, maybe a um, specific example. There's this restaurant, Fevikin, one of the best in the world. I think it's being closed right now, but uh, it's a great example. Uh, it's great kitchen. It's far away from the main road. Uh, you have to travel there several kilometers. Um, so if you have a place like this, obviously you have to figure out um, 
whether it, the food or the ware is going to be delivered to your place. Uh, otherwise, you just may find out during service that you ran out of something and you're not able to restock it. Uh, for a long period of time sometimes, when, it's, when the road is cut off or something, you have to take these things into consideration. Um, otherwise also, um, the, the location influences the menu in a way that uh, if you're in the centre uh, and you make a huge menu um, with lots of options um, and you have a small kitchen, uh, you will simply not be able to keep up with the service. So that means the menu needs changing uh, as well. So all the changes are more problematic. If you think of it in, in advance, uh, it's easier to uh, accomplish and do these changes. Um, so these are the two things about uh, the location. Also, very important, is the next step. So uh, you have to evaluate your um, the, the capability of your restaurants, whether you can dish out the whole menu. And you have to actually do it twice, before you do the recipes and after you've done the recipes. So first of all, uh, once you have like a, a draft menu already going on in your head, you have to enter your kitchen and just simply put it on paper or electronic device, whatever, doesn't really matter. And you need to do like a service net. So write down all the steps that you have to take for each uh, index on your menu, um, write a workflow chart and see whether there's processes that are repeating too often or uh, can be streamlined or uh, anything. Just think about what it will take, how long, estimate. Um, it's not going to be very accurate, but it will give you a certain pi picture of what's happening in your kitchen, whether you need to refurbish your kitchen, like change the settings, and, and, or maybe just change the menu. If you see on the first draft, when you do this net, that a simple task is being repeated too often, and you won't be able to do it as often because uh, you're by yourself, or you don't have just simply not enough stuff, or room, or both, uh, it simply can be eliminated on this stage. Once you've established the capability of your kitchen, then you can proceed to the second step and you can make the recipes and you create the workflow. And that's another step that is very, very time consuming. It is a very important step, so you need to think, of it, uh, think it through very thoroughly uh, because you just cannot just simply um, make prices on your menu, just out of your head. Uh, just pop it on the menu because it might turn out that it won't hit your target group that is already settled there. So um, you, won't, you will end up without customers because the prices are too high or too low, so they need to be really accurate and they need to pay your bills. So what's ingredients of the price on the menu? Not many people realize that. Uh, so first of all, it's 30% food cost. And that's sort of like a... Um, uh, data out of the book, uh, standardized for uh, all the businesses in the world. Uh, it's not given, you have to uh, work to achieve it, but it, it's a certain some, something to start with. So 30% food cost, 30% overheads for all the bills that may happen, and 30% fixed costs. So as you can see, there's only 10% left that is your profit margin. So you have to sort of uh, think really, really, really well about it. Uh, and a lot, and make sure you're doing the right prices. You can fiddle around with these prices a little bit, you can change the food cost a little bit. Um, for, for instance, uh, when you want to sell steaks, uh, you don't want them on a 30% food cost, you can run them with 35%, but if you have fish and chips, which is easy to produce, very uh, cheap product, you can sell it slightly uh, more, well, dearer, and give it, for example, 25% food cost, so you will uh, balance this out and you will sell both. So the purpose of the menu is to give the customers a choice uh, and to uh, make them buy evenly out of each product so you can rotate all your products. It is not good if you have a product that sells uh, let's say five pieces a month because then it's a pain to make Every time the order comes out in the kitchen, it's a pain to make because nothing's prepared, because, because you cannot prepare for that dish since you're not selling it. So the more, you, uh, the more even the sales on each item, the better. So that's what the prices are for. That's 
what needs to be taken into account and of course you have to take into account your bills and well you make an average out of uh, obviously uh, and, and all the other costs uh, expenses so labor price as well is included in the price what you sell basically pays the bills um, so that's pretty much the last step uh, what you do to confirm that everything is uh, done correctly you do another evaluation of your kitchen and your capability of serving all those dishes and you can do it in a many different ways first you can do a uh, menu tasting for your staff floor staff and kitchen staff of course and everyone needs to be able to t uh, tell something about the dish they need to know what they're serving they need to know all the ingredients they need to know how it tastes and you know what to do with it um, at the same time when you're cooking the menu uh, you're not only teaching your kitchen and floor staff but also you can measure the times and uh, estimate how long it's going to take during service and it's always good to take the pessimistic version the first times uh, you're going to measure because they're going to be the longest since you know everyone's doing it for the first time because when the rush happens well that's the time where everything needs to work and you need to be able uh, to uh, well sort of uh, squeeze in uh, well to um, adjust your workflow to it uh, so it's good to take those first times uh, which uh, are going to be the worst ones let's say at first uh, in order to be able to estimate uh, because when something that will take too long uh, let's say on 20 dishes when the wait on the last dish is about you know 30-40 uh, minutes then it means that's how long your customer your guest is going to wait for their dishes uh, so and, and, and a rush probably even worse so that's a very uh, important information uh, that you can or will, will need to adjust your menu all right so I see there's questions coming in so let's switch to Q&A mode all right hang on a second Tom is asking, I'm opening a place, when to start determining uh, the details of the menu? Tom, as quickly as possible. So first of all, uh, as I mentioned before, you need to um, sort of find out what you are comfortable with, what you want to do, what you uh, can do, um, what you're doing best. And uh, that's the, your first draft. Uh, remember, the menu is the one thing that even though it's so time consuming and it requires a lot of information, is the easiest way to, ch uh, easy thing to change afterwards and, well, it's very elastic. You can uh, switch up bits, uh, you can adjust the menu, uh, you can adjust the portion size in your recipes. Uh, there's a lot of you, what you can do with the menu afterwards. So the sooner you establish the um, sort of the ground level, the base, then you, it is much, much easier to work with later on. Um, Jerry is asking, at what level should the margin be set? Uh, are there any gu guidelines? It's what I mentioned before. So you have the 30, 30 and 10%. So 30 for, for um, food cost. Then you have 30% for uh, overheads, 30% uh, for uh, fixed costs. Obviously, as I said, it's not given. You have to work for it. It's not like you know you start a business and automatically everything falls in line and you get these uh, guaranteed ten percent of uh, you know revenue uh, of your profits. So uh, you have to work with it and you have to balance things out. As I mentioned, like you know, if you want to even out the sales, you have to drop the price a little bit somewhere and you know raise the price somewhere else so it evens out. But also, uh, different restaurants work with different percentage, food cost per percentages, and have different costs as well, so you have to adjust it, sort of. So let's say uh, a kebab place or a burger joint, uh, they will work with a higher food cost and will have lower prices, right, on the menu. Just because it's a very, very popular product, you want as many customers, guests, as you can squeeze into a daytime so uh, you want to make as many sales during the day in order to make money better restaurants let's um, I mean better restaurants are not the right word for it I mean um, different proper restaurants like fine diners 
uh, they have a foot percentage uh, slightly lower because they need to raise the price a lot because they need qualified chefs, they need, need a whole line, they have much, uh, the, the cost has to play somewhere else. Uh, they differently distributed um, throughout the business. So uh, you have to adjust it. But generally you have to stick to the rule 30, 30 and 10. That's a very standard rule um, uh, and it's a very, very good base to uh, fiddle around with when you have your own business so you can decide what percentage is best for you. Um, remembering uh, it, once you've settled uh, the costs, you have to fight for them. It's a, a very, uh, it's a hard struggle, right? Uh, there's so many aspects in the hospitality industry. Um, I mean, like if you lose a warranty because the time is up um, and the equipment breaks, you have to pay for it. Uh, the more you pay for it, the profit margin shrinks. So the same with labor costs, the same with product costs. Uh, so if you have too much losses on the product, uh, you're losing money uh, or you're not gaining any money. So that's really, really important to take into account. All right, uh, Jane is asking, how to assess the efficiency of your premises? Uh, there, is, uh, there are a few ways to go about it. So first of all, I mentioned the menu tasting that you can do for your staff. Uh, second, a very um, popular um, option for uh, Western countries are uh, so-called slow openings, which means basically you do not advertise uh, your new menu or the opening of your uh, menu. Um, you just simply open your doors, uh, see who's walking through, uh, and you're just serving the new menu uh, with sometimes lower prices, for example, just to encourage people uh, to have a little bit more. And then you see what's happening. Uh, slow opening means because the customer is paying a lower rate for the dishes, they are slightly more forgiving. So you can uh, you sort of test uh, the whole thing on a living organism. Uh, it's like a very, a very cool experiment because it will show you immediately the customer feedback and will show you the capability of your kitchen. Uh, what you can uh, also do uh, in a already functioning uh, restaurant or place you can introduce new dishes in form of a, let's say, a lunch special or weekend special. Get the feedback you need and then you know when you introduce the new dish uh, what consequences it will bring. For instance, it's like with burgers in a good restaurant. So basically, uh, if you put the, uh, it's always said like, you know, people, uh, owners are always like, yeah, you need to put a burger on the menu. People love burgers. You need to put a burger on the menu. Uh, you put a burger on the menu, uh, which seems quite easy. But then it turns out that in the restaurant setup, which is not designed for uh, burger serving, uh, it's a very hard dish to make because it's very time consuming. There's a lot of ingredients. Um, you have a lot of things to remember and of course it needs a side dish and it, it is long to produce. So uh, as you can see, uh, these things need to be, um, well, need to go together. Um, Monica, short or long menu? Uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, I do not think much of places with a very uh, extensive menus just because I know that uh, if you have 50 positions, uh, you need to have 50 customers at least a day who will order each position at least once, uh, which is impossible. So basically what happens is um, uh, when you have a very extensive menu, you have to think about uh, storing the old ingredients uh, where the sales are not guaranteed unless you have such a busy place, which I wish you have, uh, but not ev every time it's impossible. So, uh, Storing is a problem, uh, then uh, keeping the freshness and the temptation uh, with bad practices is just simply too big. Because you have to extend the shelf life of your product, uh, you need to use freezing or uh, you know, extensively uh, prolonging the life, pre-cooking, re-cooking and so on. Uh, and that's lowering the quality of your product, which may result in unhappy guests. So it is very risky. Uh, short menu gives you the possibility of quick change. Um, you don't need that much fridge space. Uh, you don't need uh, you know, deliveries that often. Um, you can plan your work. It, it is easy to serve, uh, easy to remember. And the kitchen can focus on the quality of each 
dish. So uh, in my, from my perspective, a shorter menu is much better. Uh, it's much more uh, clear for the customers. It's easy for him to pick and choose. Uh, and of course, it's e easy to react. When you have 50 dishes on the menu, and you know you want to change the menu, what you do is just you grab your sales report, and then you have uh, sales figures like uh, five pieces of each item in a month, which gives you basically no information whatsoever. So you don't know which one is selling better, which one is selling worst. Uh, and of course, the ones that are not selling are being wasted and creating more costs. Todd is asking, one second, what is Todd asking? How does the cost of renting the premises compare to the price of dishes? Lease. Uh, that is a very, very important subject. As I mentioned before, uh, some costs are by mistake not included in the price of the menu, which is a huge mistake because then the profits are going somewhere and uh, owners don't know where they've gone. Uh, so, of course, you need to include the price of the venue in your cost prices on the menu. Uh, just because it rhymes. No, just joking. But uh, the thing is, uh, the prices on the menu are paying for your bills. So if you don't include the costs, you're basically losing money. So uh, that's important, that is. Obviously, you have to make an average. Uh, obviously, you don't know what the sales are going to be, but the uh, needs also uh, always needs to be a set percentage of uh, the lease in the price of the menu. Uh, Maria is asking, do you make multilingual menus? If so, as a separate menu or as one? I reckon hospitality industry, as the name suggests, needs to be hospitable, so it needs to accommodate for all, for all the guests. And I've been there myself. I went to a restaurant and you know, I'm getting a menu in a language I don't speak. Um, they don't have uh, you know, uh, anything in English or in my language. So basically, I was just pointing finger at dishes. And it turned out I actually made a good choice, but uh, in many, many cases it turns out people make the wrong choice, they don't get what they need, uh, they can't ask questions, they uh, sometimes get things they're allergic to. Uh, there's a huge language barrier, so um, I always say multilingual, of course. Uh, and there's two ways to go about it too. So you can either make a separate menu or you can make a two bilingual menu uh, automatically. Uh, both have their advantages and disadvantages. So first of all, uh, if you spot a foreigner in your restaurant, you can straight away give him a uh, dedicated menu, which is a nice gesture. Uh, but then again, it is quite risky. Not all the guests uh, will welcome you from, will greet you from the door, and you can notice that they're foreigners. So basically, they sit down with their friends. Uh, then you have to uh, look for the menu. You have to print separate menus. Uh, there's always a uh, well. I've run it in, in, in the situation a couple of times. Well, it turns out we had more foreigners than we actually uh, had the menus printed for. So we had to swap between customers. That doesn't look good. Uh, so in my opinion, a bilingual menu is great, although there's another risk and it's something to watch uh, when you extend well, the menu uh, by putting the translation underneath each uh, index. Uh, well, you may turn up uh, with this little booklet. So remember, the longer the menu, uh, the attention span of your customer is probably 30, 40 seconds. So by the time he gets to the last page, uh, well, he will be bored and he will probably pick something from the first page anyway. So it needs to be short, compact, but attractive. Uh, and of course, when you f squeeze in a translation, it's also um, the advantage that you have always the right amount of menus because you have the menus for all the seats and covers that you have in your place. So you just basically set for the whole day. All right, so these were all my questions. I want to thank you very much for asking all those questions. I hope we covered the uh, subject completely. I thank you guys very much for watching. I want to invite you to um, watch our other entries. Uh, you can see the problem on the legs. If you have other questions, please write us on the email below. Thanks again for watching and I see you next time.